It's my pleasure to introduce Wally Eberhard, who will be introducing our speaker, Terry Kay, today. Wally has been on the Board of Trustees of the Library for 20 years now, and this past year, he, or he's finishing up his term, he said, as chair of the athens Clark County Library. He also told me that he was, literally, he was born in a Carnegie Library in Niles, Michigan. So I right away wrote back and I said, not literally. You were not born, I mean, I'm thinking in the stacks? No, I don't think so. <laughs> but he said that's what he always thought because as a five-year-old, he remembers spending so much time in this library in Michigan. So he said he was literally born there. He has been a former newspaper man and is now retired Grady College faculty member. So I'm going to turn it over to Wally. He's going to introduce Terry and then enjoy your afternoon. We will have question and answers session afterwards and then a reception, book signings and purchases. And we have a lot of his old, his, how do I say this, Terry? Your old books? Books? Previous, previous books. Thank you. He, so, <laughs> so Wally Eberhard, would you come forward? Bear, bear with me. Uh, my eyes are under reconstruction by one of the local ophthalmologists. I, he's, he's, the saying is, I, I steer, my wife tells me what to do. Uh, thank you, Barbara. If I wasn't born in the Carnegie Library, my reading life began there. Chisel over the doorway uh, with the words, free to all, which is kind of true. Carnegie bought that, paid for that library in about 1,500 others at that time, uh, but taxpayers and others kept it going. So we're grateful to Barbara and all those in the Friends who worked so hard to raise funds beyond what the county commission allots us. They uh, tirelessly organized literary, literary events like this one, hold book sales, which is wary out, and so we uh, owe you continuing thanks for all you do. A uh, few memberships are still available. This is not just another occasion to hear from Terry. It's now 40 years since his first novel hit the booksellers. And the title was? My, am I hearing the year the lights came? Uh, what he began as an after hours endeavor eventually led him to the point where he began writing novels full time not part-time at 4 a.m. Uh, before heading to the office. The Dance of the White Dog came along a few years later and is known as his signature work. It was widely acclaimed, printed in many languages around the world, and the first of three of his books transfer transformed into made-for-TV movies. There is, by the way, a White Dog Lane up near Vanna, which is near Royston, and it has not one but two zip codes. A biography, he was born in rural Royston where he's one of 12 K's on the family farm. After Royston High, he graduated from LaGrange College and eventually took an entry-level job at the Cab Weekly newspaper. He jumped to the Atlanta Journal, working for one of the great sports columnists and editors of our time, Furman Bisher, along with others including Paul Hemphill, Jim Minner, and Louis Grizzard. He turned to reviewing the lively Atlanta cultural scene for the journal then moved on to doing public relations. He's also been a screenwriter, playwright, actor, and maybe other things that we don't know. Uh, he and Tommy, his delightful wife of 50 plus years, also from Earl Royston, built her dream house and immigrated to Western Clark County about 15 years ago. He's to be found here and there, as we all are, taking a role on stage with the Atlanta Symphony, or at writing workshops or at local coffee shops. He's one of us. And here's what comes to mind in reviewing his 40 years as acclaimed and much loved author. His honors are many, including a membership in the Georgia Writers Hall of Fame. There are many more, and I won't take time to list, to, uh, list them all. You can, as they say, look them up, well earned, well deserved. He remains dedicated to the art and craft of putting words on paper building a substantial body of work 
on our library shelves, doing honestly and very well. He's tireless in support of literacy and learning and reading, remind us, reminding us that the libraries of this state have a special obligation to feature the work of Georgia authors, past and present. I can't say he's been in all the libraries and bookstores of all 159 counties, but he's hit most of them. And I think maybe most delightful, he's, as an author, he's as unpredictable as March weather. All his books feature strong and unforgettable characters, but after that, they can't be pigeonholed as mysteries, romance, children's, whatever. And it works. Finally, he knows how to hook us with a title. The Year the Lights Went On. To Dance with the White Dog, The Kidnapping of Aaron Green. Now we have The King Who Made Paper Flowers. Harry? Here is the, uh, the difference between a professor, a teacher, and a writer of fiction. If I had claimed that story of being born in the Carnegie Library, I would have phrased it this way. I was conceived in a <laughs> Carnegie Library. That offers so much more possible. It is a delight to return to this very wonderful place and to stand before a group of people who care about books, about writing, and to celebrate things. And Wally mentioned, and, and um, it, it was told wonderfully well by my friend William Ford uh, recently in the, in the Banner Herald, that this is my 40th year as a published author. Um, it doesn't seem like it was 40 years, but it was. And I have spent a great deal of time in the last couple of weeks thinking about that first book, uh, The Year the Lights Came On. I won't go into the history of how it all came about because it's been told over and over again. But, but I do want to talk a little bit about it and uh, that period of time, which is so long ago and when I was so incredibly young uh, and having no idea that one day uh, I would have as many books as I have had published, uh, fortunately. Uh, the, the 40 years has gone fast, I can tell you. Uh, delightfully fast, but fast. Uh, 40 years ago when the first book was, when the book was published, I remember we were living in a little home in Decatur, in a tiny, tiny little home in Decatur. And the book arrived in the mail, and I was, I was sitting on the sofa, holding it, uh, looking at it, waiting for that thing that we had always been told what happened to us, that, that excitement, that, that overwhelming moment of this is something that I did of, uh, good. I, I, did this, I did this well, and... And it means something to me. I wanted to be grabbed by excitement, and it wasn't there. It just wasn't there. But still, I'm holding the book, and I'm looking at it. And uh, my young son, who was then about seven, came running through the house with his friend Griff. And he saw me sitting there with a book, and he paused, and he came over, and he said, Oh, Dad, is that your book? Because he'd course heard me talking about it and I said proudly holding it well yes yes it is son <laughs> it's my book <laughs> you know I said this was his remark he turned to his friend Griff and said oh come on Griff let's go play <laughs> it, 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 is, it was a sure sign to me of what my future was going to be uh I told this story yesterday at, at a gathering up in commerce. Uh, when that book came out, I went to a bookstore, and I, I was very shy about pointing to myself saying, hi, I'm a writer, I'm, I'm an author. But I looked around the store, I, I couldn't see the book. It, you know, it wasn't present anywhere. 
And so I went up to a clerk and I, without introducing myself at all, I said, I, I've heard you, you've got a, a book by a, a writer named Terry Kay. Um, it's called The Year the Lights Came On, I, I, but I don't see it anywhere. She said, uh, wait a minute, I'm sure we've got a copy somewhere. And I started following her around the store and she was looking. And then we got to the back of the store and there was a table there that held remaindered books <laughs> and the 50 cents a piece, that kind of thing. And I thought, oh, dear God, it's only been out a week. It can't be remaindered by now. <laughs> so it's astonishing, really. Uh, and she said, no, I think I saw it right. And it was, it was there. It was there. Not on the table, but under the table leg, it was wobbly, <laughs> holding it up. <laughs> Yesterday, in a marvelous ceremony, and uh, I'm very proud to have been part of this at the Commerce Library. They dedicated the Memorial Garden, and they had these benches out that had been put there, and, and they had designed it so there were b books uh, by Georgia writers that were, uh, that were posed under, underneath the benches. And, uh, you know, and mine was to be one of them. There's a reason I was invited to come up and say a few words, so I did. But I couldn't find it. <laughs> I couldn't find I looked at all three. I read that Margaret Mitchell and Pat Conroe and Phil Williams and you name it, Mary Hood, all the writers. Of, uh, and I said, what is it? Why did they lie to me? And said, my book was here. It was there on its side holding up one end of the thing. <laughs> In 40 years, I'd come back to exactly where I was when I started all that time ago. But back in those days, I was, uh, I was one of the young lions uh, of Atlanta. And this was, this was a period of time when Pat Conroy showed up and uh, all of a sudden there was a renewed interest in writing in the state of Georgia and especially in the Atlanta market. Uh, there, were, there were a number of us there. Uh, the, and Conroy and, and, and Annie Siddons and, and Bill Deal and Robert Corum and Paul Hemphill and several others. Uh, if Phil Williams had lived in Atlanta, he would have been part of that core. Uh, but, but at that time, we, we were all vigorous and we were excited about the possibility of being published and, and how much we celebrated when one of us would be published. It was a, it was a grand thing. But that was a period 40 years ago when my first book was published. There were fewer than 10 writers in the state of Georgia being published by reputable pub uh, publishers. Now I can tell you within 10 miles of where we're sitting, there's probably 40 or 50 writers who have been published, both by reputable, uh, by New York houses, uh, reputable. They're not really reputable, they're just New York. Uh, <laughs> but, but by any publishing outlet, whether it's University Press or or, um, or, or self-published or whatever. A lot of writers are, 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 have blossomed in this state. And, and, I, and one of my missions, as Wally has mentioned, is to celebrate those people and to, and to try to bring some attention to them over the years. But I have reached that age where I am now, uh, and I, I used to joke with Farrell Sams, who was my senior, but I would, I would see Farrell at occasions. Uh, and I'd go over, he was in his wheelchair the last time I saw him, go over and kiss him on the top of the head and say, I'm so glad you're here, Farrell. Well, why, Terry, why? Because you're the meanest person I know, and when you die, I'm going to be that person. <laughs> I'm going to be the reigning curmudgeon among fiction writers in the state of Georgia, and I am that way, but I have earned it, and I'm proud of it. I want you to know. I've told this, this little story about age to a few people, and it's the best, uh, the best way I know how to explain how old I have become over the years. A couple of years ago, I decided I wanted a cup of coffee in McDonald's in Watkinsville. And I went in realizing that as a senior, I would get a coffee for 43 cents which is very pleasing to me, especially when you go to Starbucks, which is a little much higher than, than, than what you got. But anyway, so I'm there, and I told the young lady, I, 
want a senior decaffeinated coffee with two creams, please? And she said, okay, fine. And she built in, she came over and she said, that's 43 cents. And I reached into my pocket and I had a pocket full of change and I pulled it out and I had it in my palm. And I was looking at it and she reached across the counter and she took my hand and pulled it out. <laughs> And she said, look, there's a quarter. <laughs> and there's a dime. Now all we need is another dime. That's humbling. I can promise you. I, I, I actually, I've become old enough now. I, I, I do all the cooking in my house. And so I shop a lot in grocery stores and I truly enjoy it. I mean, I love doing it. And I go to the Publix in uh, Watkinsville a great deal, um, enough to advise the manager of the store on where to put things, uh, <laughs> or where to find them, really, that they've, they've hidden somewhere in the store. But on Wednesdays, if you're a senior, you get 5% off, if you may know, which is a very nice thing. I'm so old, they give me 10%. Uh, and, and I'm a very appreciative of that. Ah, oh, Lord. The book that followed, uh, The Year the Lights Came On, uh, was after Eli. It was not supposed to be the second book. The second book was supposed to have been a book about uh, a fictional account about Ty Cobb. Because when I when the first book was published, I was invited to Boston, to Houghton Mifflin, to uh, meet with a publisher and, and my editor. And my editor at the time was a woman named Ann Barrett, who had been the uh, uh, the American editor for J.R.R. Tolkien, for example, and was regarded as one of the great editors in this country. And we were at one of those old Bostonian restaurants and I, I have never felt so out of place and so nervous and so intimidated in my life is, is at that particular moment. Um, and we were sitting having lunch and Austin Olden, who was the president of Houghton Mifflin said, what are you working on, Terry? And I knew I needed to tell him something, but I had not thought about that as a question that might be asked. Uh, but I, I did what all good, good writers do uh, you, one of our abilities is to improvise instantly because we're accustomed to lying, you know, and we tell a good lie and you can get by with it. And so I said, well, I'm, why, I, I'm from the hometown of Ty Cobb and I'm writing a book of, uh, about uh, how a small town reacts to celebrity. Ty Cobb, well, they loved it. And I come back to write. So I came back and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote and they rejected and rejected and rejected until finally the editor, I now had another editor who is now the president of Farrar Strauss. Um, but uh, he came down and he was Pat Conroy's editor as well as mine. And he said, I, my advice to you is quit this book and go do something else. Well, I went into a very great depression and um, I, I was moping for quite a while until my wife threw me out of the house. And she did. She actually told me to leave the house. Uh, and, you know, and I said, how can you do this to me? I'm, I'm depressed. I, I'm sad. This is uh, terrible you're doing. Uh, she said, uh, well, what she didn't understand, well, maybe she did, I guess, was that um, my background is in theater. And I love dramatic moments, just absolutely love them. And um, so I got out my suitcase and started packing everything. And uh, I told her, I, I remembered a line out of Tennessee Williams' Glass Menagerie. And I said to her, tell the children I'm sure I'll never see them again, <laughs> but I will send them postcards from the Pacific coast of Mexico. <laughs> I love those moments, they're great. <laughs> and I started to leave and she said, take the typewriter and I said, why? I'm finished writing, I'm, I am a one book wonder, I have nothing else to say. And I, 
and I would write and blah, blah, blah. She said, go write Eli. Now, Eli, I didn't even know she knew about it because I had worked on it, drill writing. And I think writers need to drill write like athletes need to do, because uh, you know, side travel hops or whatever it is they do. And, uh, and so I had worked on a screenplay uh, on this particular story because I'd had an argument with James Dickey over deliverance. I had thought he treated the mountain people as mutants, and I, I, treat, I knew them not to be mutants. I knew them to be survivors. And so I had written a story that had been broadly inspired by an Italian playwright named Ugo Betty and a play called A Crime on Goat Island. Uh, so I, I had this, this screenplay, and I didn't know she had read it, but she had. And I, so, so I, I, I took my typewriter and I went down near the Atlanta airport and I found a motel that was advertising a week stay for 50, $67.50. It's quite a place. If you didn't have a switchblade, they would rent you one. <laughs> but uh, so I locked up, and I was incredibly angry with my wife because she'd thrown me out of the house. I'd never been treated so poorly, and I had seven older sisters for crying out loud. <laughs> but uh, but anyway, so I, I, I uh, locked up there, and the first day I put my typewriter down, typewriter, typewriter, and whirled a piece of paper in it, and I wrote, I wrote the sentence, you know, for two days he had watched the house and waited, and I didn't know where it came from. To do, for two days the Irishman had watched the house and waited. I didn't know where it came from. There is a poet, and I wish I could remember his name, who wrote a line once saying about writing, God or the gods depending on your perspective, will give you one line and the rest of it is yours. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. I think there's a great deal of truth in it. Uh, and in and, and my writing, the struggle of writing, I have always, it doesn't matter to me if it takes a month or two months or six months to find the first line. That's all I need, just the first line. Excuse me, I'm diabetic. I have to do this. But um, uh, in, in, in fact, when I wrote White Dog, um, I sat down and it flew out of the brain again. Uh, he understood what they were thinking and saying, old man that he is, what's to become of him? And the minute I wrote that sentence, I knew the entire book. I knew everything in it. I knew everything about it in in, in a flash, I knew it all. I wrote it in, six, in two months uh, because it was more a matter of translating than it was creating in that particular book. Anyway, um, I, I, the, the book came about. The first day I wrote the first page and I thought that may be the best thing I've ever written. And I became more and more angry with my wife. <laughs> for throwing me out of the house. And uh, in fact, I'd never see my children again. It would be as if it was gonna be awful, you know. But it worked. It's one of those kind of things that worked and who knows why they work. I just know that often if you get a good running jump into something, uh, it makes it easier. And, and that was what happened in that case. The first four books, well, I think of them as sort of the the first period of my life, the beginning, the learning, the experiencing uh, period of, of my life as a writer. Dark 30 came after, after Eli, and it, it, it recalled the all-day family murders down in South Georgia, and some of you will remember that. Now, I wrote it mainly because I had a discussion with one of my brothers, uh, two of my older brothers are uh, distinguished members of the Methodist clergy, and um, uh, I had a discussion with one of them, and I never asked one which one it was. But anyway, it was about the difference between vengeance and justice. And when I finished the book, uh, I understood it. It is an incredibly violent book, I can promise you. 
but what inspired it was incredibly violent also. So when I finished it, I understood the difference and I thought, why didn't you know that before you wrote this story? And the difference is simple. Vengeance is what you do. Justice is what I do. See, it's all perspective, that kind of thing. Those are the things that I enjoy finding out when I, you know, when I, when I do get a chance to say, what is this about? I've said this before. I've said it here. I see it everywhere I go. I do not write to tell a story. I like to discover one. And in that discovery process, that keeps me interested in doing a, a job that I never intended to do at all when I was growing up. So it was good. Uh, the White Dog, of course, was uh, the signature book, as Wally has mentioned. And it was the time that I, I decided to take a risk. I was working in the corporate world, and some of my my mates from that world have shown up today, and I'm so delighted they're here. I was working in the, in the corporate world, probably making the most money I would ever make, having all kinds of perks and good insurance, all that sort of stuff. But I was unhappy with the fact that there was something that I had to prove to myself. I wanted to prove to myself, and that is, could you write? I did not want to reach the age I am now and say, look back and say, oh, you didn't try. You didn't try. Failure was okay. I didn't care about that. You know, failure was all right. I figured I could get something, you know, uh, to make a living or, or to put food on the table, and that was interesting to me. So that, that, that was a, a real breakthrough, though, to write the, the White Dog book. Uh, it stunned me at... Um, at how, how well that was received, though no publisher in New York would touch it. They simply, they simply were afraid of it. They were afraid of it. It took me years to figure this out. They were afraid of it because it was a... a, 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 a well, it was perceived to be a Southern book, a Southern story, when in fact it could be said anywhere, anywhere in the world. It didn't have to be in the South. I said it in the South because where I live and what I know, it's what I understand the language and the rhythms and everything else. So that's why I did it. But it didn't have to be in the South. But because it was the kind of book that it was, there was no dysfunction in it. And New York publishers expect Southern literature to be dysfunctional. <laughs> I said it again. If I had grown up in a dysfunctional family, I would be so much richer than I am today. I can tell you. Writing so much better things. And then, of course, uh, there were the other books that followed, and I had so much joy writing each of them. Uh, each of them was a new experience. Each of them came to me from a, a different voice, that sort of thing. Until we get to this one in, in today, The King Who Made Paper Flowers. This is a, uh, uh, this was a work of great pleasure. I have joked about this book a lot, saying it is so simple. It should have been be, begun with a, a look, Jane, look. Uh, <laughs> but it's that simple. It really is. And yet, I loved the people, the characters that, that uh, I was dealing with in, in, in putting this story together. It was inspired by a man who lived in Havana uh, back in the 50s in the period of the changeover from Batista to Castro, who was addled and a street person and walked about giving flowers to ladies and writing poems and uh, much beloved street period, known as the unofficial mayor of Havana. Uh, and, and, and it's a story that's always been in my mind and years and years later, I was having lunch with uh, Carl O'Connor, I did an episode of In the Heat of the Night for them and had a good opportunity to spend some time with him. And he told me he was looking for a story about a man who was a kind man who would go about doing good in a seaport port town. And I thought, I've got that story. I know what that story is. I never did uh, get anything to him about it, though I promised him I would try to. But I was working on a book at the time, and I didn't. I didn't abandon it to write something else anyway. But 
I never forgot the story. And this, I, I could tell you this, but I thought, well, I needed to write down something about what it's about. Then I realized I'd already done it. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, wrote, I wrote the book jacket, and this is, I'll read this to you. When Arthur Benjamin steps from a Greyhound bus in Savannah, Georgia, he is immediately robbed by an affable street magician named Hamby Cahill. It is Hamby's first act of thievery, and the remorse of it is so overwhelms him that he finds lodging for Arthur in the castle, a warehouse supposedly owned by Melinda McFadden, an eccentric and fragile grand dame, dame of, of imagined aristocrat, aristocratic uh, uh, society who is known as Lady to the strange assembly of street people she has arbitrarily selected to be her guest. There, Arthur finds his family, an ex-con shoplifter, a disgruntled seamstress, a young artist suspected of being a hooker, and a former boxer known as Lightning. For Arthur, it is the company that will change his life, as he, in turn, will change the lives of everyone he encounters. Yet he does not know he will become entangled with political arrogance over a minor traffic mishap or be targeted for brutality. He does not know he will encounter Wally Whitmire, proponent of the destiny of the dominoes, or that he will become an unqualified mayoral candidate put forth to serve as an irritant to the incumbent Harry Geiger. And he does not know he will be looked upon by the people of Savannah, fortunate and unfortunate alike, as an icon, a beloved figure who wears a cape of invented royalty and distributes paper flowers made of cocktail napkins as gifts of comfort. Arthur only knows that he has found his place and his purpose. And that's the only hint I will give, give it. It's an incredible read. <laughs> was, that, was that forward enough? It's okay. I didn't even know that. Uh, so, any, so anyway, um, I, I, if you get it, I hope you enjoy it. I enjoy the writing of it. And uh, I, it, I think it's the kind of thing that, that won't shock anybody. Uh, I, I will tell you that some of the, some of the first, some of the things that I've written have shocked people because they, they, I, they have read the, the White Dog book and they say, what? Oh my, you wrote that? You <laughs> wrote well, yeah, I did. I did because it's a different story and a different voice and everything else. I I, I do want to have some questions here, but I want to quickly. Um, I, I've been making a little list of questions people have asked me over the years, and because of this 40th anniversary thing, I, I wrote some of them down in there. And and this is true. The, the first book. This was the question I got the very much when the year the lights came on. You did what? A book? You wrote a book? You? That was it. That was it. And, uh, and it stunned me. I, yeah, I thought, well, maybe everybody should be doing this. I, I don't I, No earthly idea. After Eli, which is the one that my wife exiled me for, and, and I became a road. It's a psychological horror story, really, kind of thing. Uh, this is the question. Now, you have to understand, my mother died before my first book was published, uh, which is the one thing I regret in my career, that she didn't know that I wrote books. But after Eli, do you think your mother would have approved of that trashy story? <laughs> and, and the same of Dark Thirty. Are you not ashamed of yourself? Does anybody in your family still talk to you? And I think several of them quit talking to me because of that story. The the one I, the, I a lot of questions are well, White Dog, of course. White Dog uh, sold extremely well in in, in Japan. Uh, in one year, it it sold about two million copies. Uh, it was very very popular over there. And I get this question a lot: How do you react to the popularity of the book in Japan? I drive two Toyotas. <laughs> I'm all for it. And then the Shadow Song is a book that a lot of people like. In fact, somebody just told me this was a favorite book. Uh, and and I, I love the book. It relates to my history as 
a, as, a, as a waiter in the Catskill Mountains when I was a very young boy in a German Jewish resort up there. It's, it's a story I like it. It's about the relationship of a young Southern boy and a young Jewish girl named Amy. Well, here's a question that I got from, uh, from that one. Was there really a girl named Amy? And did you date her? <laughs> My wife asked that question. <laughs> it's embarrassing, it really was. There was no Amy, I didn't date her, but I dreamed about her a lot. You know, that's <laughs> The Kidnapping of Aaron Green, which is the only book that I've ever written where I deliberately wanted to try to write something that was plot-driven instead of character-driven. And the question was, was uh, why did you kill everybody in the end of the book? Well, I didn't know what else to do with them, so I just killed them. It was, uh, they were all evil. They needed to die. It was that kind of thing. And then there's the one that was published here in Athens, Special K, Bomb Bomb. The Wisdom of Terry Kay. The question was, wisdom? Is that a joke? <laughs> Again, from my wife. She, 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 all of the, 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 the stuff. And Song of the Vagabond Bird, which was the last book that was published, said, since women do most of the reading, why did you write a man's book? I didn't. I wrote a, a book about men for women. And I hope that some of the women learn something about men by reading that book. And then, of course, the new one, the king who made paper flowers. You? You wrote a book? That's what I'm getting on this one. Again, from my wife, it's a sort of thing. But there are some serious questions, too. Is there a character that you created you would like to know in real life? Yes. Yes. I would like to know Lottie and taking Lottie home. Uh, she was more real to me than any character that I have ever uh, created. Uh, even the characters of my childhood, Lottie was the one that was really real. Uh, which book was a favorite writing experience? The first book, The Year the Lights Came On, by far. Which do I consider the most important? Uh, the Book of Marie, by far, by far. Because it is a story of the civil rights movement that I don't think has been told very often uh, by Southern writers especially, the Southern white writers especially, because of the fear that they would not be accepted in New York, and it was not accepted in New York. Mercer University did that. Uh, if you didn't write, what other profession would you enjoy pursuing? I'd love to have been a teacher. I would have enjoyed teaching a lot. I think uh, that's a pleasurable and an honorable profession, and I, I'm sorry that I haven't had the opportunity to do it as much as, as, as I have. I've enjoyed the workshops and the other things that I've done around Athens, but I would love to have been in the classroom. Uh, and then I've asked this one, the name some of the works that had great influence on me as a writer. Uh, let, me, let me give you a few of those. The Glass Menagerie, The Sacrilege of Alan Kent, you know, by Erskine Caldwell. Rome Hanks by Joseph Pennell. It's a Civil War book. A Hundred Years of Solitude. Uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Uh, God's Trombones. The Prophet. And my favorite of all, which I think is the very greatest uh, story ever written in world literature, is the story of the prodigal son from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11, verses 11 through 32. It is the most perfect story, in my view, that has ever been uh, shared with, the, with people on this earth. Anyway, those are the questions that I have been asked. I want to share some of them with you. Now then, please, we've got a few minutes. Questions? Anybody? Anything? Yes? Have you ever had a book that you felt was kind of based on your life at all, even I've never had a, a problem writing about things that I'm willing to confess. Uh, and, and I mean that sincerely. <laughs> a lot of things I don't care to confess. Because, but for the most part, to answer that question, we, we, we live with this idea that everybody has a book in them. 
and they all I don't believe that at all. I think everybody is in the midst of a book because a book is all around you. I have nothing about my life that's important enough to, to make a story. But my goodness, if the people I've met that would make great stories, but you can't make a hole. I, I don't try to make a hole at all. I don't try to go pick one person out and write his or her story. That's not it. I want one fragment. I just want a fragment of that person and let me then build on it. Let me make cloth out of that thread, so to speak. It's a good question. Thank you. Yes. Do you still have the Ty Cobb book in you? <laughs> no. <laughs> actually, actually, the Ty Cobb book became uh, taking Lottie home. Uh, when I ultimately realized, wait a minute, you know, Cobb was interesting, but uh, I think that's a very, very narrow audience. And when I, I'm much more interested in writing a book that might interest a lot of people, you know, rather than just a sports crowd or the people from my hometown who wouldn't talk to me anyway if I wrote that book. So, you know. Okay. Anyone? Hmm? Anybody else? Okay. Now, what? Well, you have one? Wally, did you spot somebody? You did. Okay. Yes. Now, I did what? I didn't hear, again. A screenwriter. A screenwriter. Into a screenwriter. I would, I would very much to, like to have written all, I've had three books made into Hallmark Hall of Fame movies. I would love to have written all three of them. They wouldn't let me write them at all. But after I saw them, I'm sort of glad that they didn't um, because they had that. And I'm not complaining about it. My goodness, no. I was a, it's quite an honor to, to have that sort of thing. But it's a Hallmark Hall of Fame thumbprint or a signature to it. And that's not what I wrote. I wrote something different. In the White Dog book, they made a love story. They reached in and pulled out the love story between Sam and Cora and made a movie out of that. And I think the love story is there, but that's not what my book is about. My book is about the dignity of aging, uh, which is a whole different kind of thing. But you can't do it. It's just, it's just almost impossible to, to incorporate a whole book, to reduce it so that it looks like it's seamless and it's what, what was written in the book can't be done. However, of all the writing exercises I've done, I enjoy screenwriting, maybe more than anything. It, it's simple. It's really simple to do uh, because you basically just let people talk and then you add, this is where they're talking and that's let the director take care of the rest of it. That's all. Okay. May I? Yes. <laughs> uh, I know I'm I'm embarrassed to say that uh, I, I would very much love to be able to write poetry because I have tremendous respect for it but I simply don't have the gift to do it uh, I, I can write poetically but I can't write poetry and uh, but but tell you the truth most people who are writing poetry can't write poetry they're writing <laughs> Poetically. They're writing poetically. Uh, I mean, that's the toughest thing in the world to do. To write. A very great poem, to me, is the perfect distillation of a very great novel. And a very great novel is the perfect extension of a very great poem. So that requires more than just simply sitting down and putting thoughts on paper, that sort of stuff. I, 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 I talked about this thing with poetry because when I was young, I used to memorize poems and, and uh, tell young ladies that I had written these poems for them. You know, uh, 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 silly stuff. But, but I did it. But I, I was amazed because how much poetry affected these young college students, these young ladies in college. It really did. Anytime that you can see them sigh over something 
as ridiculous as E.E. E. Cummings. You know, he's, somewhere I have never traveled gladly beyond any experience. The voice of your eyes is deeper than all yeses. What does that mean? Is anybody? <laughs> but the ladies loved it. It was kind of fun. However, I don't write, but I will, I'm going to end with this. And I, I, I started doing this at almost every place I go. This is poetic, poetic. While reading, I have been a cowboy and an Indian with Zane Gray and Louis L'Amour, a Confederate soldier with Joseph Pennell and Philip Lee Williams, a pirate with Robert Louis Stevenson, an orphan with Charles Dickens, an eccentric with Flannery O'Connor, a dust bowl traveler with John Steinbeck. While reading, I have been a whaler with Herman Melville, a gold digger, dreamer with Erskine Caldwell, a small town barber with Wendell Burr Berry, a runaway with Mark Twain, an old time gospel god with James Weldon Johnson. While reading, I have been a B-flat coronet player with William Price Fox, a battler of windmills with Miguel de Cervantes, an attendant in the house of gentlemen with Kathy Heppenstall, a basketball player with Pat Conroy, a firefighter with Larry Brown, a defense attorney with John Grisham. While reading, I have touched the ocean's darkest depths and walked on planets and solar systems beyond our seeing. While reading, I have climbed mountains lost in clouds and walked the different road with Robert Frost, engaged at the little cat feet of fog with Carl Sandburg and danced to the language music of Byron Herbert Reese and Edgar Allan Poe and David Bottoms. While reading, I have flown the Atlantic with Charles Lindbergh and pierced the call of space with John Glenn. While reading, I have stood at Gettysburg with Lincoln and in Montgomery with Martin Luther King Jr. While reading, I have rejoiced with the still living of Dachau on the day of liberation and I have seen the unspeakable sorrow of Hiroshima on the day of killing. While reading, I have sat at the feet of Buddha and Abraham and Moses and Jesus and all the other men of God and also those who would kill God, the insane, the madmen, the bigoted, the fanatics. While reading, I have been boy and man, girl and woman. I have been old and young. I have died and have been reborn. While reading, I have become people I cannot be, doing things I cannot do. And I do not know of another experience that could have given me such a life. Thank you. Read well. His gifts with the written word have captured our imaginations and enriched, and enriched our lives for 40 years. His books will grace the shelves of hundreds of libraries for a good long while. We honor him for contributing his time and talent to the literary life of this nation, state, and community in many ways, especially for his devotion to those who make this library home. And for all that and more, the Athens Clark County Library Board of Trustees appoints Terry Winter Kay, an honorary trustee of the Athens Clark County Library, with all the rights, privileges, and honors thereto pertaining here and elsewhere. Oh, how wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.